So a very colorful title here. How do you like your materials with multifunctionality and reconfigurability or just lightweight? I'm, um, of course, I'm, I'm um, uh, trying to, to be satirical here in um, our understanding or in our experience with coffee these days, right? So a few years back, um, when asked, how do I take my coffee? We just would say, you know, seriously, very seriously. There was just either coffee or no coffee. Then uh, later on, the coffee started having colors, right? So we could either get it black or white. And then today, when you go to Starbucks, you know, you'll have half calf, half decaf, double soy latte, you know, and all this. So you effectively customize your drink entirely. So this is where I'd like to draw a parallel to our world of materials. When you look at this very busy plot, and those of you who are not scientists, please don't feel intimidated. Basically, it's a plot with colorful domains, which represent all the materials that we know how to make today. When you look at the y-axis, I chose to plot strength, but it can be any mechanical attribute. It can be toughness. It can be some kind of a measure of mechanical resilience. On the x-axis, you have density. And the picture that comes out right away is that we're very good at making materials that are simultaneously strong and heavy or lightweight and weak. What we're not so good at is getting into the so-called white space, and that is making materials that are simultaneously very lightweight, but also very, very strong, or at least um, non-breakable. So this is a so-called log-log plot. And what that means is that even a modest increment within the space already represents a substantial change. So how do we get into that white space if every material that we know how to make today is already plotted here? So one way to think of it is by this concept of architecture being a key enabler in materials design. So maybe some of you have been here. This is the Great Pyramid of Giza. This is the largest man-made stone monument. It stands about 150 meters tall and it weighs 6 million tons. So by no means a lightweight structure. Now, in contrast to the Eiffel Tower, which stands twice as tall, but it weighs a thousand times less. So this is three orders of magnitude less. And it's just as mechanically robust and perhaps it required a lot fewer slaves to build it. So what that teaches us is that by being clever about the architecture that you're using your material, you can use a lot less of it without any sacrifice in the mechanical strength. And so these are some of the materials that we make in our group and that I would like to, to take into this world and, and make the world basically out of these. So you can see that some of them are periodic, some of them are not. These are all, um, I think one of the talks in the earlier, Sophie perhaps uh, mentioned some of these as synthetic, some are not. These are all synthetic. We made all of these. In fact, those of you who are fans of Doctor Who, here's a micro TARDIS in the bottom, in the south uh, east corner um, of this slide. Uh, that's about one ten, one ten thousandth of your hair diameter. So these materials are really unique. And here's why they're unique. They embody every length scale from nanometers, and that is one billionth of a meter, to microns, that's one millionth of a meter, to millimeters and centimeters, et cetera. And so we effectively built in an extra level of architecture into materials that's above atomic scale, but below anything else. And so here are some of the properties that we're getting from these. So what you're looking at is a very, very brittle material. Imagine a brick or um, your coffee mug with a severe case of osteoporosis. And we're pushing on them, we're compressing them. They should be crushing and dying. They should be fracturing like immediately and catastrophically. Yet these nano bricks seem to think that they're sponges and they recover. So we're compressing them and you can see they're wrinkling. This is very, this is chalk. Can you imagine bending or compressing a piece of chalk? Of course, this would never happen. So it's, it's this so-called nano size effect. Now here's another example of these architectures. Now we built different densities into the, into it, different patterns. And you can see when you're compressing this one, the bottom part is taking on all the deformation, but the top part doesn't even know that it's being deformed. It's just going along for the ride. So now imagine you can design all these trajectories of how materials deform. Now, here's the next example. So this one is a fractal nano lattice. So you see, it looks a little bit like a construction crane, right? But of course it's at the, on the order of microns. So 30 billions of a meter. And look at how each leg is now kinking. And now you have these self-similar unit cells inside and we think it's gonna snap and break at any moment now. It kind of hurts me every time I watch this video. And it fully recovers. So there are very, very unusual and unique properties that emerge in materials at these length scales, especially when you add um, architecture to them. Am I, for, okay. And then here's, oh, sorry, I'm moving. Ah, my PowerPoint froze here. Come on, cooperate. Okay. So here's an example of a so-called woven architecture. So this is effectively your hammock, right? So we're all familiar with this engineering principle, don't push on a rope. 
So here's a hammock. This is an interwoven rope of one of these materials. And here's what happens when you push on it. So we can actually push on it and pull on it at the same time. So we're pulling it and you can see it's stretching really, really far. And then most ropes, when you reverse this deformation and you start going down, would never offer any resistance in um, compression. But now we're pushing on it and it's offering some resistance. And you can see, so now you can imagine you can build this interface between any two parts that you won't, don't want to come in contact. So it won't damage the part. It can have its own thermal properties, for example, a hot part and a cold part, um, and it'll offer resistance in um, either type of deformation. So all of these effects emerge only at the nanoscale. And so here's um, an example of how these nanoarchitective materials can be used to prevent ballistic impact. So this is projectile capture. So we shot these little, little tiny nano, sorry, micro bullets at them. These are silica microspheres that are about 10 microns in diameter. And it looks like these materials are not only uh, beneficial in the quasi-static range where we slowly compress them or slowly tense them, but also when we shoot something at them. And so we're able to capture um, impact. So when you think about this, it's, it's, it, it really opens up an entirely new paradigm in how you design your materials. Because if you prescribe some functionality into them a priori, you can get entirely new properties that seem to be fully designable, just like your coffee. So this is a very busy chemistry plot to show you that we can make different kinds of materials. We can make organic materials like carbons and polymers. We can make metals out of them. We can make batteries out of them. So you can see a battery normally contains um, a cathode and an anode electrodes. And so we can now, um, if you look at, the, at this electrode, when we, when we lithiate it, when the lithium goes into it, it can form a pattern that very much resembles the pattern in the bottom right of my slide here. So making batteries out of these materials is not only a, a pathway to create solid state batteries that are much safer and much lighter than the ones that catch on fire, but also you can prescribe whatever patterns you want in it. And so it, it just opens up an entirely new uh, degree of freedom. A couple more uh, examples here. Some of these micro uh, architecture materials are able to efficiently capture water. So those of you who live in the Bay Area, Imagine you're in San Francisco and on one side of your roof, you can have a solar panel. And on the other side of the panel uh, of your roof, you can have a panel of our micro trees that are able to capture the fog droplet, the water droplets out of the fog and then um, collect them into drinkable water or at least fresh water uh, just from your roof. So you can design an entirely <laughs> self-sustainable house uh, just by using this mechanism. So here's a length scale of these guys. So this is about five microns and you can see these branches. So these are trees. Uh, I'm drawing inspiration from all the talks before me. These are these are trees and I don't, um, we prescribed our own pattern to them. So I don't know if they have those really cool patterns there, but um, they're able to capture water very efficiently just by this virtue of micro and nano um, architecture. So now the big question is, of course, you know, well, so what? Okay, so you're making all these materials. They're kind of cute. Maybe they're pretty to look at, um, you know, but what's the, what's the big deal? And the big deal is this. If you are clever about prescribing and designing the right architecture and understanding the atomic level microstructure of your material and understanding how this nano induced size effect plays a role. It is possible to create entirely new classes of materials whose properties are no longer coupled, like in the plot that I showed you, right, where everything is tending from left to right, uh, that you can now decouple these properties and you can design for properties and you can optimize for properties. So it's an entirely new by design uh, world out there that can be explored if we could uh, really scale them up. And so this is probably the biggest obstacle at the moment. And there, I know there are multiple pursuit to scale these, to scale up these materials, but it's not as trivial as um, it may seem. Time. And the reason, sorry, just uh, 10 more seconds. And the reason why we'd want to do this is so that our kids grow up in the world where um, we don't need hearing aids and we would just effectively write the cochlear and insert it directly in the ear. Um, our iPhone 83 will never have to be recharged at least for a year. The balloons will not have to use the helium material, right? Or helium because um, the material that we're using is uh, very lightweight, so we can just evacuate it. Uh, we can imagine uh, lightweight armor being made of these materials. And then, of course, this is if we were all together, we would probably have some of these delicious brownies. And so, what we're working on now is chocolate nano lattices, which are 100% taste, 99.9% .9 air, and 0.01% calories. Thank you very much. <laughs>